If you ever, I don't know, it might be, be a dumb question on my part, but have you ever been in a situation, experienced a situation that was just so challenging that you just didn't know what to do? Some kind of a situation that has, I don't know how do I say this, drastically interrupted your life? You ever experienced that? I think there's few things that make us feel more alone than facing down difficult challenges. Challenges that just seem to be greater than what we can handle. Greater than our resources that we have, uh, whether it's physical, emotional, financial, just greater than our ability to, to handle it. You know those situations where you lay in bed and your dog tired, but you just can't get to sleep for your mind racing, trying to come up with some kind of a solution. Trying to figure out what the answer is. You ever experienced that? Yeah. I think all of us have. What do we do with that? So many times we need to just take a pause. Just a pause moment to realize who we are in Christ and be reminded of where our strength comes from. I read an interview with a young man. His name is Alex Honnold. I don't know if I'm saying his name right or not, but that's what I'm going with. Um, he is a, he's famous in the sports world for his free solo climbing. Now, free solo climbing is climbers that don't use ropes or harnesses or whatever to, to climb these rock cliffs and, uh, and so forth. And it's probably a good thing Kathy is not here this morning. She might have just passed out looking at that picture. But in September of 2008, Ar Arnold was climbing the Half Dome Rock wall at Yosemite National uh, Park. And there was a filmmaker that documented that climb in a short film that was titled, Alone on the Wall. Now, does that just give you the heebie-jeebies or what? Alone on the wall. This, uh, this half dome is a huge granite rock. It's 2,000 foot high. And it has a, a sheer face on it. And that is what he climbed with no ropes or harnesses. It's a very dangerous climb for even traditional mountain climbers that have ropes and harnesses. But for a free solo climber, it's insane. It's death defying. It, it's, it's a huge challenge. Well, on this rock flate face, about 1,800 foot up, there is a small ledge that he's standing on right there that is called the Thank God Ledge. It's, a, it's just a, a little ledge. It's maybe 12 inches wide. 
closer look at it. And climbers, when they, they get up to that ledge, it's a place to where they, they have a solid foothold and they can just kind of relax and pause for a moment in their climb and just get themselves together and ready for the last 200 feet that they have to climb yet. Well, that day that Arnold climbed this ledge, when he got to the thank God ledge, for some reason, all of a sudden he froze. He was all alone on that thin lip up there of granite, 18 foot high, off the valley floor. He looked at the sheer rock surface around him and realized that if he didn't have a good foothold, if his fingers slipped even just a little bit as he was reaching for the next crevice, he would fall 1,800 feet to the valley floor. And for one of the few times in his climbing career, Alex Honnold was afraid. This is a world-class climber, one of only a handful of people in the world that will take the risk of climbing like this. There's something unique about them. Neuroscience scientists have even run tests and what they call functional MRIs on Alex to study his brain and how it processes fear. This is how well this is, is known about him. And what they found is, is that he doesn't. He doesn't process fear. He doesn't have that feeling of fear, except on the rare moment that he's experiencing there on the Thank God Ledge, 1,800 feet above the valley floor. Well, it, it's like we said, there's a film being made of, of his, this climb to document it. And for five long minutes, he stood there on the Thank God Ledge, just struggling with his fear to get it under control and to figure out what his next move was going to be. His legs were starting to cramp up, and Alex turned around and felt his way toward the, the closest rock, jutting, little rock, jutting out of the, the dome face. And he pushed himself upward on that tiny rock, and he grabbed the crevice all the way down there. There it is, down at that end, to climb up the rest of that 200 feet to the top, which he did. Now, I think I'm safe in saying that none of us would ever stand at the base of Half Dome and look up and say, I think I'm going to climb that, sir. Right? Yet, so many of us we know what that thank God ledge is. In the middle of devastating situations that we face, situations where we can't go back, we can't even imagine going forward, overwhelmed, feeling alone, feeling ill-equipped, feeling stuck, can't figure a way out just unable to do anything about whatever the situation is that you're facing. It might not be standing on a 12-inch wide ledge, 1,800 foot up in the, in the air. But we know what that helpless feelings feel like. And I think this is a situation maybe that young King Solomon was feeling himself here in 1 Kings 3. 
He felt alone. He felt overwhelmed and and ill-equipped to face this challenge of being the leader of God's kingdom, his people. So 1 Kings 3, we're going to read all of these verses here right now. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father, David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this greatness, great kindness in him and have given him a son to sit on this throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count in number. Now, if we, let's go back. What is it God says to him? Ask whatever you want me to give you. Simple little short question there, isn't it? And you notice how long Solomon goes on before he gets to saying really anything? Isn't that what a politician does? Too much information. You wonder if God sometimes is up there, yeah, I know all of that. Just answer the question. So we get to verse 9. So give your servant servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Verse 10 says, The Lord was pleased with Solomon, with that what Solomon had requested. So God's reply. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for a long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do for you what you asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will will have never been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Now Solomon, we, we know who Solomon is. He's the youngest son of King David. Theologians estimate that he was probably around 20 years old when he took uh, over his father's throne. Now traditionally in that time period, who became the next king? It was an oldest son going on down. Well, we know that King David's family was just kind of, I'm sorry, messed up. (laughs) And here we find that the youngest son is now being made king. It has been made king. And we know that if from the history of that, that there was, when Solomon was crowned king by David, that an older brother was outside getting everybody to crown him as king. So there's a lot of strife that is going on, and King Solomon is the youngest, only around 20 years old. And what does his prayer say? I'm young. Basically, I'm just a pup. I need help here. This is overwhelming. And he has this pause moment on this thank God ledge where he evaluates where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And he has this prayer to God. Now think about it. Being in the king, he's already king. Being the king, 
Solomon had all the power and authority. He had assistants. He had advisors. He had an unimaginable amount of resources right at his fingertips. And yet, although he had all of this, all that the world could possibly offer him, it wasn't enough. Solomon, even at age 20, was wise enough to know that he needed more than a crown. He needed more than a bunch of yes men to be able to lead God's people. So he found himself on his own, thank God, ledge, alone facing a a massive challenge. And on that, that ledge, he found his foothold. He found a grip. How did he do that? But by calling on God for the help he needed. So I think we could look at this story of Solomon and probably not learn anything necessarily new, but I think it reminds us of of at least three, three things. Solomon's story reminds us, first of all, our inadequacy is God's opportunity to work through us. Our inadequacy is God's opportunity to work through us. But that's a tough lesson, isn't it? Especially in our society where we uh, celebrate being independent. We, we celebrate individualism. Uh, in layman's terms, maybe the, we celebrate meanness. We all want to look like winners. Like we have it all together. We want to look like we, we don't need anyone else's help. That we can handle it. But just as you read through the Bible, there seems to be this theme that is repeated over and over and over again in that God chooses to do his greatest work through average people who rely on God's power to work through them. God chooses to do his greatest work through average people who rely on God's power to work through them. You might have heard of Pastor Jim Cimbala. He's a pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Uh, Been the pastor there for many years, him and his wife Carol. But he had a stretch of two years there toward the beginning of the, that ministry where they went through a time that he was just really frustrated. He was exhausted and feeling anxiety. The attendance was low. They were barely making ends meet financially and him and his wife were, were working hard to get this church thing going. But it didn't seem like God was was working in in the congregation at all. And then one night, Jim was so depressed during the service that he couldn't preach. He just stopped and he admitted to the congregation that he was depressed. He was just too depressed to even preach that night. And he asked the congregation members to to come to the altar and just pray. Well, that night, the church experienced a spiritual awakening. As the members, they cried out to God. And Pastor Simbola realized that he had not asked God to guide him and help him in his ministry. 
He came at this place to where he had to pause moment in a difficult situation where all of a sudden he had to reevaluate and he went to God. Ever since that night, prayer has been the foundation for all of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, all that they do. And today, that congregation is, is over 10,000 members. Uh, their ministry reaches not just throughout Brooklyn, but throughout the whole New York City area. Not too long ago, Pastor Simbola, he's written a couple books, but uh, he was looking back at that moment. Uh, those two years of frustration that he had. And, and this is part of, of what he, he said. I discovered an astonishing truth. God is attracted to weakness. God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. Our weakness, in fact makes room for his power. Acknowledgement of our weakness makes room for God's power. When Solomon admitted his inadequacy to God, God stepped in and offered his power to work through Solomon. And he does the same for us. I also think that this story of Solomon also reminds us that it is impossible for us to reach our God-given potential without God's guidance. It's impossible for us to reach our God-given potential without God's guidance. We know that in Genesis 1 and 2, it's a record of, of God creating the universe, the world, and all that is in it. And we know that his, his crowning jewel of that creation was when he molded Adam out of the clay. And he breathed his breath, his life, into Adam and then created Eve. And he, God said, remember, going through the creation account that he looked at that creation that's on that sixth day, and he said, this is very good. Well, what made that very good? It was a desire that God had to create them to be in relationship with him. Intimate, trusting relationship with him. And in that relationship that Adam and Eve had, they had full access to all, the, all of God's character, all of God's power, all of God's wisdom. In other words, we could say their, their lives lined up perfectly with God's will and purposes for being, for their being created. John Collins and Tim Mackey are the hosts of a podcast that is called How to Read the Bible. And in one of their podcasts, as they were looking at this 1 Kings 3, they suggested that Solomon's request, his prayer here to God, is an opportunity to undo the damage that was done by Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden. You remember Solomon asked for. He asked for a discerning heart and the ability to distinguish right from wrong. In the Hebrew word that is used for discerning is literally translated listening. So Solomon is asking for a heart to listen to God, to rely on God's guidance instead of his own resources. Solomon is asking for a second chance to walk with God. 
to see life through God's eyes, to rely on God's power instead of his own. If we had the perfect ability to listen to God and to see life through his eyes, think about it. Wouldn't it eliminate all kinds of confusion and anxiety and stress that we experience? I mean, wouldn't we find meaning and joy and peace and purpose in being able to use the God-given skills that he has given us, that he's created in each one of us? Wouldn't that make a difference? How would that happen? It would happen from listening for God's guidance. Listening to God for his guidance. That's what happens on that thank God ledge in our lives. We pause and all of a sudden we are listening for God's guidance. And finally, in Solomon's story, I think it reminds us that our life is not about us. Our life is a testament to the world of what can happen when God adds his awesome power to our average abilities. St. Teresa of Avila, she lived in the 1500s. She was a Spanish Carmelite nun. Uh, Carmelites are a division of the Roman Catholic Church. And being, uh, living there in Spain, one part of her job was to travel around Spain and to establish new monasteries. Well, she had a, a young lady that went with her, a, a young, edu uneducated young woman. Her name was Anne of Bartholomew. Now, after Teresa's death, Anne was promoted to that role. She was given the opportunity to serve uh, the church, but it seemed just way beyond her abilities. She was fearful of it. She felt unworthy, ill-equipped to be able to do that ministry that was given to her. But eventually she, she struggled through that. And God used her in, in a mighty way that was recognized by the leadership. And they promoted her position to establishing Carmelite monasteries in foreign countries. Like Solomon and, and Alex Honnold, Anne found herself on a thank God ledge. A pause moment in her life where she knew she was way in, way over her head. So she, as she had had written it down, complained to God in a prayer. We don't ever do that, right? This is what she, what she prayed. Lord, how can you ask all of this of me? I am nothing but straw. And she wrote that in that prayer, she heard God say, Ah, oh, but it is with straw like this that I light my fire. It is like straw like this that I light my fire. Because we are human, we are so restricted by our human limitations, by our own perspectives. And in that we forget that we are created to exhibit the divine image of God, to be Christ 
like and to exhibit the kingdom of God in all that our human in all of our human activities and our work. Every action that we take, every conversation that we participate in has an eternal influence. Our daily lives are meant to be pure and unwavering reflection of God's character, purposes, and His glory. Solomon asked for a discerning heart and the knowledge to distinguish right from wrong. He didn't ask for a jewel for his crown, a feather in his cap, but he asked this so that he, the kingdom of Israel would reflect the character and the purposes and the glory of King of Kings. Sadly, like all human kings. He failed in many ways to listen to and follow God. But God never gives up on his creation. Isn't that good to know? That God never gives up on his creation of which you were part of. God never gives up on me. He's always ready to hear our prayer. Especially if it's a prayer like Solomon's. Asking for wisdom. Marion Wade, in 1937, this young man, he founded a residential cleaning and moth proofing business. Now, have you heard of that? Moth proofing? This is 1937. Over the next five years, that business expanded so much that uh, he even franchised the, the business. But in 1944, Marion was badly injured when a batch of cleaning chemicals exploded. He nearly lost his eyesight. And it was during this recovery time from these injuries that Marion found himself on the thank God ledge. He was in an overwhelming situation and paused a moment in his life and he turned to God for help. And in his prayer he turned his whole life over to God. And as he later wrote in the, his autobiography, this was part of his prayer. I don't expect any miracles. I don't intend to sit back and expect you to run everything. But I want you to tell me how to run things. And to send my way the men I need to do the job. Can you hear that prayer? It's a prayer like Solomon's there. Well, it wasn't very long after that that some graduates from Wheaton College, it's a Christian college just outside of Chicago, they came to him and applied for jobs with Marion Wade's company. Two of those men, Kenneth Hansen and uh, Kenneth Wesner, they ended up being going into a partnership with Marion, and they founded the business Service Masters. And we know what that is. We have one right here in town. It's a residential and commercial cleaning business, but it is based on the idea that they were using their skills to serve their master, Jesus Christ. Today, Service Master, master International now operates in the U.S. and eight other countries. 
Last year, they generated $3.5 billion in, in revenue. Do you think God might have blessed that prayer? When Miriam was stuck on the ledge and paused, realizing, I can't do this. I need help. And the only place I can find help is with my heavenly Father. Like Solomon, Mary and Wade confronted this own inadequacy on his thank God ledge by praying to God, letting him guide him and equip him for the challenge that was in front of him. And God answered that prayer more abundantly than Wade could have ever imagined. In James 1, we know that James is a half-brother to Jesus. He reassures us that anyone can ask for God's wisdom and that God's desire is to give it abundantly. Give it generously without finding fault. Wisdom and discernment. This is what Solomon asked for. This is what God gave them. Think about those two words, wisdom and discernment. They are reflections of God's character. And they have to be, they're necessary to accomplish God's purposes. So this prayer is always aligned with God's will. Give me a discerning heart, a listening heart, and the knowledge to distinguish right from wrong. When we pray with that listening heart, we are turning our lives back over to the Creator God. The Creator God to use for His glory. When we do that, God will use His awesome power in our average abilities. And He will accomplish through us more than we could possibly think of. The scripture says more than we could ever imagine. Father, we uh, thank you for this. It's so easy for us to get caught up in the hecticness, the busyness, the, the difficulties that we face in just living in this world. Father, we all face different situations, different times in our life to where all of a sudden we realize we can't do this on our own. Situations where we're on that thank God ledge, pausing in our life to turn to you And to say, give us your discerning heart. Give us your ability to distinguish right from wrong. Father, I pray that for each one of us, this morning your spirit has reminded us that no matter how difficult the situations we might face are, that you will give us that pause moment in our life that is on purpose to make us just to stop and turn to you. the source of all that we need to be able to do the purposes that you have prepared for us 
to good works prepared it in advance for us to do. Father, thank you for this reminder. Help us to live in that now, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Our last hymn is not in the hymnal. His eye is on the sparrow, so the words will be on the screen.